Good afternoon, or riperile, as they would say in the tongue of the Shangan, which is, of course, the local language we are we speak over here. You are most welcome to the Sunset Safari here, Safari Live with Wild Earth. And we're sitting in the Kruger National Park, the western fringes thereof, on a little piece of paradise called Juma Private Game Reserve. And I'm sitting at the site of what was the most astonishing scene this morning, where a female hyena was set upon by 10 or 11 wild dogs. They bit her bottom, they took chunks out of it, and then she backed into a peltiforum bush. And while her business end was weaving from side to side, and she was howling and growling, and the dogs were running around her, yipping and whelping, they left her alone eventually. And eventually she scuttled off through the bushes, and they went off, I don't know what they went off to do, I think they killed again a scrub hare perhaps, and it was all the most astonishing thing. We felt the amazing sense of sag savagery of Africa, and then as we came down to this waterhole here, where peace reigns, an elephant bull came down and a chin spot batters called overhead, and suddenly the savagery was replaced with the ultimate calm of the wilderness, and I was struck with the juxtaposition of that amazing viciousness and then the complete peace that the wild gives us. So welcome to it. We hope we'll, we'll get something as exciting this afternoon, but we never know what's going to be around the next corner. You are on a live safari, as I said. My name is James. On camera today, we have Dave. Hello, Dave. Dumela. Ah, Dumela. Dave is speaking South Sutu this evening. Uh, that's wonderful. Botswana. <laughs> that was very unexpected. OK, and uh, because you're on a live safari, it would be very, very nice to hear from you during the course of the drive. Hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. You can also talk to us on YouTube on the UChat function, however that works. I don't know. Our plan is to basically head off probably towards Arethusa during the course of the afternoon, and then as it turns to evening, we'll head back into this area. The dogs apparently were left on Biffle's Hook, which is just to the sort of north of where we are now, which is the right-hand side of your picture, the, my left-hand side. And they were left there. They'll probably sleep during... It was a warm day, about 30 degrees, uh, which is roughly 92 degrees Fahrenheit. No, it's not. What is it, 28 is 82, it's 85, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I'll get it right eventually. And they will be sleeping under a bush somewhere, and then as it gets cooler during the day, I suspect they'll probably head towards some sort of water where they know there will be an antelope species or two that they can go in and try and catch for their supper. Either water or perhaps towards a clearing, big clearings down on quarantine, lots of impala that end. So welcome to it. We hope to have an action-packed three hours for you. Scott Dyson is on the other vehicle and in the final control. Louise, back on the vocals, and Leanne on the keys. Let's head across to Scott, get an update from him, and I will see you at Arethusa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Warthogs. This is a male, as you can clearly see from the appendages sticking out from his rear. And... He's a little bit nervous. It's not uncommon for Warthog to be nervous. He actually trots it off as we came around the corner and then the fresh green shoots that he was nibbling on as he came to us slowed him down slightly. I think he's running after a female that disappeared off into that thicket ahead of him. Wonderful. Well, a, a good start and welcome on board with myself. My name is Scott, for those of you who have never met me before, and I'm teamed up with Jean-Dre Girding on camera. He is back from travels in Madagascar, Australia, who knows where else, but he's been all over the show, but he is thankfully back. For those of you who don't know, he's been a cameraman at Wild Earth for quite some time, a valuable member of our team, and really happy to have him back behind the camera. So, that is going to be the person bringing you, hopefully, some wonderful images of wildlife this afternoon. I've just been filling in, him in with what's been happening with all the regular characters, Karula, Tingana, Shadow, the Inkahuma lions, the general movements of game, elephants having moved off about a week and a half ago, uh, not too many ellies now. So I've just been filling him in on what's been happening, which is obviously going to take probably the whole drive and long into tonight around the campfire. Now... My plan is to work the southern reaches of Juma, 
to start with and that's because not too many people focused on this area this morning because of all the action that was occurring in the north of Juma which I'm sure James has told you about it's incredible stuff with wild dogs hyena even a jackal was on the scene there's also a uh, the possibility that the Inkohuma part of line are somewhere in that northern reaches of Juma. So we're going to probably head there a little bit later to give James a hand snooping about there. But for now, I thought we should invest some time looking for Karula, a leopardess. Now, for those of you who were on the Sunset Safari yesterday, you'll remember me saying that one of the guides who traverses the properties to the south of Juma said he saw Karula with a suckle mark about five days ago. Now again, you can get as excited as you like, but this is just essentially a rumor. Until we see something with our own eyes, consider it a rumor. That is what I've learned in the bush. It's probably your safest uh, bet so that you don't get excited for the wrong reasons. But there is a chance that despite all of our thoughts, she still has cubs that she's successfully nurturing. So in a snoop around here. She was last seen by that guide south of our property, so I figured we can snoop around here and see if we don't get lucky. Which it appears we have already, not with the leopard we're looking for, but with some of the largest kudu we get in this area, or largest antelope rather, being the kudu. One's got a passenger, a red-billed oxpecker, sitting on its shoulder. It looks like a young oxpecker though because it lacks the red bull so it would have been born this season along with the young oxpecker there's a young male kudu which you can see his little horn sticking out there you'll also notice he's got a white chevron between his eyes if he faces us again whereas between the eyes of the ladies there is no white chevron so that's another feature that you can even distinguish young male kudus before they've got horns. Sadly, it's not furnishing us with the right angle here. Come on. Ah, there we go. There you can see those white chevrons. Interesting that he's nibbling on the ground like this, but not untypical of a trout situation. Now, whether he's feeding on grass or simply small shrubs, it's hard to say, but they technically will usually be browsing on leaves, which he could be doing just at ground level, but he could also be capitalizing on the fresh green shoots that are emerging after the rain we had a couple of days back. Good. Mercedes and thank you for your kind words saying that Safari Live is a, a wonderful experience that you're enjoying being a part of but you are concerned that our broadcasting this live information may assist poachers and in information with where to possibly come and do their dirty business um, Mercedes there is a minuscule chance in my opinion that any poacher is going to watch our shows for the benefits of gaining knowledge and therefore coming in and poaching animals here on Juma. I think the chances are slim to zero. Um, but that's just my opinion. Having said that though, we do take the stance where we do not show rhinoceros. So even though they occur in the Sabi Sands, and that's common knowledge to everyone, or at least any poacher with half a brain cell, um, they know where they occur. That's not the hard part. The hard part is obviously finding them, killing them, and not getting caught doing that. So despite that, though, we do not show rhinoceros for that slim to zero chance of a poacher watching the show and then coming and poaching that rhino. So that is the most highly sought after animal at the moment regarding poachers. Uh, there's not really a poaching problem with the other animals of this area in the Sabi Sands. Um, Obviously the bushmeat trade may be an issue in some other areas, but it's not a problem here. So we aren't really assisting in poachers, I don't think, and even though uh, we could be, um, it's an unlikely portal of information that they would use. 
Glad that you asked though, because it is a major problem poaching and that is why we don't show the rhino. Anyway, we're gonna send you across to James with another large gray animal. Marvellous, marvellous luck here. We've just turned onto Arethusa, onto the cut line between Simlambili and Arethusa, and there is a beautiful herd of elephants. They're all heading north into Simlambili at the moment, so we probably won't have a very long sighting of them. But it's wonderful to see them. Nice big herd, probably about 20 of them. Some, quite a few of them have already crossed. And a little baby there. Mm -hmm. Youngsters, there's that floppy eared female, we know her. Of course, that floppy ear will affect her slightly in that she won't be able to flap her ears quite as much in order to cool down the brain on a hot day like this, but it's not too hot, she'll be alright. Here comes another whole group. Huge car, Dave, sorry, that car there is massive. So massive, in fact, that she's not a cow, but a bull. He was clearly travelling with the herd in the hopes of finding an estrus female. That's the only reason that was, he would be with the herd. And more and more of them are streaming out of the bush. And they look like they've had something to drink. They're covered in mud. And I suspect they've either been at Red Dam, which is not too far from here, or they have been at Arethusa Dam. So thank you, Kevin Rock Knight. You say that there were elephants at Arethusa, and perhaps these are them. They're certainly covered in enough mud to have been at the big Arethusa Dam, which is now almost dry, but it is full of good mud, of course, for elephants. A little bit fuller after the rain. Another floppy, floppy eared elephant. Little one here. Very young, only about sort of 80 years old. Look, can you say hi? Just entertaining herself. I think elephants, I think they get bored walking through the bush, eating, eating, eating all day, and once they have some time. Another one. I think they quite enjoy just having a smell. Just an investigation, they're quite curious. And that's sweet, that's only about three feet from us where she turned. There's a fairly large one. Now you just keep on moving there, big lady. And go. Oh, sir, only about eight feet from us. There they go, quietly off into the Simbambili afternoon. In the background, a virtual starling says goodbye to them. I can't see him, he's somewhere around over here. Wasn't that wonderful? What a great start. Off we go. There, there we go. Now, we're going to drive down the area where Tingana was seen last night by Scott. And I know he was very full yesterday, so maybe he won't have moved too far during the course of last night. Um, I will try and get an update on the radio at some stage as to what happened here this morning. And let's get go back across to Scott, get a brief update from him, and we'll carry on down this way. Shame, I hope the James and Dave's camera is not terminal with its illness but I'm glad you joined us when you did because I did hear some virtual starlings alarm calling in these leadwood trees in front of us here but they've just stopped so maybe it was a false alarm or maybe whatever threat they did see flying past hard to tell but it's so important, so I was just telling Jandre how wonderful little birds can be that the birds of male leopard. It was a massive, massive male leopard that these birds were all 
shouting their disgust at. Central uh, portions of Juma. We are now heading west along. The animals got free. Words of my song shall be. I'm not sure how much you copied about what I was saying, but basically, we're just checking for any tracks along our southern boundary. Thankfully, the animals, unlike us, have got no restrictions. They can go where they like. And it's far better that way than vice versa. to know exactly which lioness I posted and it was the Inkuhuma lioness apologies Ryan for not mentioning them I should have let you guys know who it was um, but yeah it was four out of the five Inkuhuma ladies whether the fifth one was nearby but we just couldn't see her we're not sure but they were vocalizing like mad it was probably the most vocal I've ever seen them in over a year of being here. So, special evening. Happy memories regarding that. Now the problem is we don't know where they've gone since then, Ryan. <laughs> interested to know how can we be sh so sure as to know which lines we are seeing at any given point in time um, it's tricky but there are certain people um, some of our viewers I know Nikki uh, has got a great uh, grasp on which lioness is which within the Inkuhuma Pride I look at them and they all look the same to me um, but for some of you guys who are getting such great views from our wonderful cameraman on possibly big screens, you're often actually getting better images than we are here. It's kind of like relating watching a live sports game at a stadium to watching it at home. Sometimes at home you actually get better views and it's the same for, for this live safari experience. So you can tell individuals apart, but it is difficult. In general, though, what guides will do, and I, and I speak on behalf of most guides here, most of the guides will not know the differences between the Inkuhuma ladies. They'll just see five ladies. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm fairly confident that is the case. Now, what they will be looking at when determining its one pride from another will be territory and composition of the pride. The area that you're seeing them in will be, you know, usually the local resident pride. You don't very often have imposters or nomadic animals coming through. Um, so territory alone is huge. And then obviously composition. If there's three older lioness, one young, one male, that will also be good to tell what's what regarding the different lion. The leopard are a little bit easier because they are solitary and their spot patterns are often easier to distinguish than those of the lions. Great. James has found you guys some giraffe. See you later. Well, there, of course, is a large giraffe. A bull, an old bull. Let's just assess his condition because I don't think he looks particularly healthy. Dave, if you wouldn't mind focusing on his backside where you can see his hip bones sticking out. You can actually see his ribs sticking out as well. So the giraffe taking its toll, I think, on this fellow as well as the fact that he's not the youngest giraffe I've ever seen. And you can 
tell that just from the state of his skin. His skin is in places being devoured by filarial parasites. And if you look at his face there, you can see a couple of notches out of his face there. But he does still have very nice little eyebrows. His eyelashes, long, sweeping giraffe eyelashes. And he's just chewing his cud there, finishing off his lunch for the second time. He's a rather a splendid fellow. That little notch on the middle of his nose is the, probably the filarial parasite just eating away at his skin. It may also be from a fight. You can see that the top of his skull there, between his ears and all the way down to his nose, is quite sort of gnarled and bumpy. And that is from fighting. And I often use the similarity between human beings and giraffe, where if you examine the skull of a rugby player or an American football player, German player, you'll find that the skull is a lot thicker. It has deposits of calcium on it and constant head bashing. And I think the giraffe is very similar. The older they are, the larger that medium horn or the gnarled bumps on the skull become. There's a nice example of that filarial parasite. There, if you go down his neck, if you mind, there you can see there, the bottom of his neck there, a very definite hole in those filarial parasites that eat away at the skin of the giraffe. He's a big old bull. They weigh almost 1.4 tons. Now, I don't know what that is in stone. To me, the use of stone as a measurement of weight is, uh, well, it belongs to the use of the ox wagon. Um, but I suppose I can't understand it. So if anybody's watching from Britain, I think Britain they still use stones. Um, tell us if you wouldn't mind, with 1.4 tons, which is 1,400 kilograms, or roughly 3,000 pounds, what is that in stone? I'd very much like to know. And this is the only mammal, or the only ruminant, that weighs more than a ton. very astute question coming through from Pittsburgh and Audrey you're an astute 12 year old obviously and you want to know if there are any animals that will change their diets completely as a result of the drought. Audrey yes there are in many ways the most obvious example to me would be well I'll give you three one would be the first would be the smallest and that's the bush baby which is a little primate that we find here it's a nocturnal primate and during the summer months would normally be eating insects but because we don't have so many insects because there's no rain, they have moved on to their winter diet already, which is tree gum. So they will try and get acacia gum, the gum of the acacia tree, so that's one. Impala, another one, they are mixed feeders, browsers and grazers. They would normally be grazing at this time of the year, but they're doing very little grazing at the moment. They're doing far more browsing because there is so little grass. Well, there has been so little grass the last three or four days, that beautiful rain that we had has created a flush of green grass around the place. And then, Audrey, the elephant's exactly the same position as for the gira as the impala. They quickly, the two hawk eagles chasing a uh, chasing a, a wallbird eagle there. See that? I think that's what it is. It is. It's two African hawk eagles having a fight. Look at them! I think I missed, they're not hawk eagles, sorry, I'm just trying to identify them, but they're having a right old dog fight in the fight there, in the, in the air there. There's a Wahlberg's definitely the one above. There we go. Oh. They're all the same species. I wonder if they're not all three Wahlberg's. They, no, they're not, you know. Mm, I don't know. They are. They are, they're Wahlberg's eagles. All three of them are Wahlberg's eagles. And uh, Louise thinks maybe a lover's dispute, it's quite possible. They're not very happy with each other. The one has caught a thermal and gone way up higher than the others. Yeah, they're coming towards us now. Wasn't that amazing to see them lock talons like that? 
And I know they're Wahlbergs because they have very thin tails. And as soon as they turn sort of away from the wind, then their tails go very narrow. And when they're turning and they're banking into the wind, they spray the tail out, and that gives them more purchase in the air. And they're just following that thermal up and up and up and up. And beautiful blue sky and clouds that you can see back behind them. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? easy that camera work is it and Wolberg eagles I think we'll probably move on to monarch butterflies that'll be a good test piece and um he's gone he has headed it off just behind us I think we'll leave it where he is isn't that amazing so Audrey I hope you got all that elephants impalas bush babies good examples Basically, any animal that can move on, has moved on to their winter grazing, could move on to their winter food, would probably have done so by now. That said, if they've panned slowly to the right here, you can definitely see a very obvious flush of green grass on the ground there. And that, three days ago, was brown, barren grass. Debbie, apparently you had asked about the grass. Well, there it is. You can see it now. Three or four days is all it took, and only one dumping of rain. Now, the thing with a grass plant like this is, of course, that because they haven't had proper summer rain, they won't have built up the reserves under the ground. So now we've had a bit of rain. They've quickly flushed up. There's a kudu running across the road. He ain't stopping for no one. flush up and that of course creates a loss of nutrients in the base of the plant. Now because there are so many grazers who are so hungry at the moment you will find that there's going to be a lot of pressure exerted on those grasses. So as this new flush of green is cut off by the grazers so the plant will need to use even more nutrients to push up fresh leaves in order to gain more nutrients. And you can find in a situation like this where you've got so many hungry animals and a lot of dead grass plants as a result of the drought that you get an overgrazing effect. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. We will need a bit more rain if we're going to avoid something like that. to know about old age and whether or not animals die of old age and whether we find them out here having died of old age elephant buffalo and giraffe were the three specific species that we wanted to know about uh, zoomy mike we don't know because normally nothing dies out here of old age except the odd elephant and so sometimes you'll find a carcass of an elephant or so but you see as soon as they die even of natural causes they will, event, they will be found by hyenas and lions, ripped apart and eaten by vultures, and so they don't last very long. Elephants can die of old age. Highly unlikely that a giraffe or a buffalo would die of old age. Let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. We are now heading south towards Arathusa Dam. Okay, everyone. I'm going to need your help here. It's not easy. It's far away, but this is a kingfisher that I'm not too sure of. I think it could be a gray hooded kingfisher juvenile. I can see a bit of chestnut on its belly. The size seems right. It's got a very light kind of gray mottling on its breast and up to its head. So it could be the gray head or hood. I always get it mixed up whether it's a gray hooded or a gray headed. It's a gray headed. So I think it could be a juvenile, which is wonderful. If we're patient, we'll probably find its parents are going to come and greet it and maybe give it a snack. It's probably still 
lurking nearby, Mom and Dad. Look at the way it's bobbing its head up and down like that. Quite a typical kingfish emotion. They'll do that when trying to focus on certain things at different depths or different distances, rather. So it's a focusing mechanism, as well as just, I think, a bit of a general habit for them. You might be able to hear a black-headed oriole calling faintly in the distance. No. I'm just bringing up a picture in my book here, or rather in my app, which will provide us with better images of youngsters. Yeah, it's a youngster. Awesome. It's a juvenile grey-headed kingfisher. Now, I've only managed to show you one of these, one adult so far this summer. Let's have a quick look at it here on my little app, Jandre. It's a tiny picture, sadly. But this is this grey mottling that I was talking of, that you may be able to see. Yeah, the glare's a little bit better. And I'm just going to pan across this way. Look at how beautiful the adults are. Absolutely awesome. So that one's still got some development to do. But I'm hoping if we just hang around here for a little bit longer, thanks, Chandra, we're going to be able to maybe get to see the adults making a kill and coming and it either them coming to it or it going to them to beg for it. We sadly can't get much closer than where we are. Maybe we'll just leave it be. Let's give you one last view after having a look in the, in the book, though. A little bit to the right, Jandre. There we go. You should... Where has he disappeared to? Why can't we see him here? He should still be there. Ah, there he is. Sorry, Jandre. I'd completely covered him with some bushes in the foreground here. So not the best views, but you can see that ever so slight chestnut coming through on its rump. And that could well be a new bird for your bird lists. Speaking of new birds, for those of you who are not on the Sunrise Safari, I saw two black crown night herons at the Buffalshook waterhole. So Hopefully, if James heads past there later, or myself, we'll be able to find them for you. I didn't manage to get them on camera this morning. They evaded us. But I'm hoping that that, too, will be a, a new bird for a lot of you. Awesome, awesome little night errand. Good, we're going to continue and send you across to James with some hippo. Chewing them off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just came down the road here and stopped in order to try and fix the fact that you couldn't hear me last time I was stopped. And um, we looked to the left, and there was this old fellow standing in the puddle. Um, he didn't look particularly pleased. David said he looked a bit grumpy, and then I reminded him, of course, that a buffalo doesn't really have the muscles in his face to be able to grin like a Cheshire cat. So whether or not he is feeling de as depressed as he looks, or if he is in fact feeling a profound sense of joy and exhilaration for being on camera, one cannot tell, of course. One can tell that he is chewing the cud. He, much like that giraffe, is a cud chewer or ruminant. Oh, you see, he just vomited into his mouth there and is now chewing the cud again. It is amazing they have to do that. And you can see lots of foam coming out of his mouth. That is just simply a function of the fact that he's chewing and chewing and chewing and that saliva will eventually form a foam. They don't normally allow us to get this close. He's only sitting about eight feet from us and he's completely relaxed. He's probably been lying in this puddle for much of the day, relaxing in the shade of the quarry bushes and combretum bushes around him. It's a perfect place for a buffalo bull to be. And he's not a particularly big fellow either. He's probably so happy in this little puddle that he's prepared to wait for us to go away and leave him alone again. And he'll lie down and enjoy the couth. Isn't he a lovely chap? <laughs> I think he's profoundly great. 
old bull, and we can tell that from the shape of his horns and the fact that the keratin on the top, the keratin sheath on the top of them, has been scraped off after years and years of rubbing their horns up against tree bark, and often you find them with these kind of reddish tinge to their horns, and that's from them rubbing against tannin-rich barks, often on the Combretum or bushwillow trees that we have. And also see where the oxpeckers have cleaned away the fur on his face. That's just from the wear and tear, basically, of them taking ticks off. I just want to see if he won't lie down for us. It could be quite interesting to see. Like I said, it's not a very hot day. It's actually very pleasant. 30 degrees out here is very nice. 84 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> some delicious mud there, of course. <laughs> Did you see him there? I'm sure you saw him go... Mm. You basically saw his stomach heave, and then the bolus came up underneath his neck and into his mouth, and that's what he's rechewing now. Mm -hmm. He's also um, snotting from his nose, which is distasteful. David, let us leave this buffalo ball to himself. Goodbye, old fellow. Whitney, I'm sorry about that. I know I described what he was doing as vomiting in his own mouth, and you said that made you do the same thing. Um, <laughs> I apologize. That's really not what, we, what I meant at all. But yes, that is what they do, of course. Right. Thank you, Tom, and... Dallas, you say the giraffe is 214 stone, so that's 1,200 kilos, is 214 stone. Because one stone is 14 pounds. You see, I mean, you really have to have the most exceptional ability at mental arithmetic to be able to convert at will the imperial and metric systems. In fact, you've almost got to be a genius to operate in the imperial system alone, let alone to have the metric system as well. I do hope one day that the world will go metric. I don't believe that we will ever get it together enough as a species to uh, make that happen, but it would be very nice. Stone, 14 pounds. I mean, who decided that 14 pounds would go into one stone? Riley, you are 13 years old and there are some little buffalo. Um, before we look at them, Dave, I wonder if there aren't some more in the water hole here. Riley, you're 13. You want to know if the skin disease would kill the giraffe. No, it won't. They all have it. All those, all giraffe have that kind of, it's not a disease so much as a parasite that just eats away at the skin and leaves the odd sore. And no, it won't kill them at all, Riley. Don't worry about that. Um... There's a couple more buffalo in here. This is Red Dam. And I think this is where Scott had his bucking, his bucking bronco buffalo yesterday. Is that right, Dave? That's correct. And I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was an amazing thing to see. It looked like, exactly like one of those bulls that the cowboys jump on and then are, are released into the rodeo ring. And he was doing exactly that same kind of bucking and rearing motion. No doubt I've got all of that term terminology wrong, so those of you who are from Texas or other states where rodeo is a big thing, you can correct me. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. I wouldn't fancy the chances of a cowboy on the back of one of these things. Now, <laughs> Tom in Dallas, you say, I'm not sure that the balding face of that buffalo we saw is not just male pattern baldness. No, I am actually something of an expert in male pattern baldness, Tom. In fact, 
I am possibly the world's greatest authority on male pattern baldness, having experienced it myself. And, um, of course, I've now come to accept it. And, well, I've sort of come to accept it. And uh, before I came to accept it, I did an immense amount of research into how I might avoid it. Uh, I can safely tell you that what that buffalo has is not male pattern baldness, but oxpecker-induced baldness. Um, I have a severe case of male pattern baldness, and that is why you have never seen me without my hat on. David, on the other hand, does not have any such problem at all. He has the locks of hair um, that... Um, I'm just trying to think of the celebrity that they most look like. Um, well, I'm calm. Alanis Morissette, probably. Hey, Dave? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, Louise has actually come up with a much better one. He looks a bit like Slash. <laughs> I would also look like Slash if I could, I promise. <laughs> yes, of course, and I did worry much more. My worry about male pattern baldness uh, did uh, reduce slightly as um, I realized my slight resemblance to Jason Statham, and I was uh, driving... <laughs> I didn't realize it until I was... I parked my car once. At a, at, at a garage or a filling station, as you call them, and one of the petrol garage attendants came out to help me out. And he looked me once over and he says, You are the transporter. I said, What? He said, The transporter. I said, um, I'm not sure what you mean. So he took his phone out and he downloaded a picture of Jason Statham. And he says, Look, the transporter, it is you. And I said, um, and then he, then he stopped himself and he looked at my car, which was a fairly aged Opal Astra, and he said, oh, no, it's not you. Anyway, I was very pleased to be confused for Mr. Statham. especially in a situation where there are people involved and uh, people with bleeding hearts hoping to do good for the animals. You say every piece of the biosphere is connected and every change affects everything else in the biosphere and you're absolutely bang on correct. This is why it is so dangerous to give water to animals when the rain doesn't give it to them. It is so dangerous to feed animals when the grazing runs out because the fact that there is no rain, the fact that there is no water and no grazing will inevitably affect the herbivores. As I've said before, that will in turn affect the carnivores. But there's a delicate and um, a delicate and dynamic equilibrium, as we call it. And everything, like you say, is dependent on everything else. So when the rain does return, it's important that there has been a die-off of herbivores so that the grasses and the trees can recover to what they were before. And when we start interfering, thinking that by just making some kind of micro-intervention that we're doing good, nine times out of ten, we create an effect that we don't understand, we didn't understand, we didn't think would happen, and it turns out to be a bit of a disaster. And the water provision for animals is one of those ones, one of those obvious effects. There are some impala, and we'll just have a quick look at them, and then let's head across to Scott and get an update for what he's doing. Well, I'm hoping that James has some luck with possibly the Anderson male leopard across on Arethusa. There was chatter of a set of large male tracks on the western side of Arethusa yesterday afternoon, as well as monkey alarm calls. So, there is a chance. Oh, the Impalas are fighting. Off you go, back to James. Sorry, just those two young Impalas seem to be having a bit of a fight there. 
and they'll be sorting out a little dominance hierarchy. I think they'll move into the open, and if they don't, I will move for them. No, there they go. So those are two young yearlings. They're just over a year old, born in November last year. We can tell that from the size of the horns. That is the typical size of horn for an impala of that age. And so they won't be having a serious fight. There's absolutely no chance that they're going to be breeding this year, not unless they're seriously advanced, which they don't look. And so rather than fighting for any serious reason, they're just kind of having a bit of a play. And they will learn, of course, how to use those horns in the serious business of fighting over mating rights and fighting to hold the territory when they're eventually about three years old. All right, let's head back to Scott, let him finish his conversation. We'll continue towards Arethusa Dam. I hope you managed to get to see a glimpse of them going at it. I'm interested by the fact that they are already getting a little bit feisty. It's very early for them to be fighting with one another. Usually it's only around May that they will perform their full-blown routing. Obviously leading up to that they do need to practice and maybe that's just what those guys were doing. There have been tracks of a large elephant bull moving in the same direction as us, so I'm hoping he is not too far ahead of us. The tracks did look quite fresh. They are now off the road. I think he veered off to the left. Who knows, maybe he's across on Arethusa. Did you guys see an elephant on Arethusa? I'm not sure if you did or you didn't. I'm getting a feeling uh, that you saw a breeding herd there. So not a bull, so maybe the bull is still here, but he was heading across towards kind of the central portions of Arethusa. observation in the few months that you have been following Safari Live and that is that it appears that there are more adult elephant cows than there are adult elephant bulls and that is possibly the case. The problem I guess may be that you're only getting to explore a very small area of what is a gigantic reserve. We get to traverse 2,000 hectares. It is literally a pinprick within a pinprick within a pinprick of the 3 million hectares plus that is the Transfrontier National Park that we are a part of called the Kruger. Now, because we are only exploring this tiny area, you know, we are not seeing the full effects of what may be happening around us. And I feel that we don't have nearly as ma many elephant bulls here, especially the big bulls, as there are in other parts of Kruger. Now, having said that, I do agree with you. It doesn't appear that you see as many bulls as adult females. And the reason could be is that younger bulls, possibly, uh, who are joining up into breeding herds, give you the false impression that there are actually more females than there are, but they're just young males. So that could be something that's leading towards you thinking that there are more females than males, simply because not each young bull does get pointed out as a young bull when you are looking at a breeding herd. But finally, I would like to say that I, I do agree with you, and I cannot give you an explanation for the reason that I do think, in general, there, there probably are less bulls than cows. Not too sure what would be the cause of that. Elephant bulls don't fight to the death very often, even though they may have very serious fights with one another. It's not a common thing that you will find elephant bulls fighting to the death, although it does happen, but it's not like a lot of them are gonna be getting wiped out during their intraspecies fights. I'm not too sure if anybody else can shed some light on that to even confirm whether the populations of the males or the females do differ greatly within the Kruger Park. I'm actually not too sure about that. But good question, Larry. Certainly got my brain spinning in overdrive, so thank you for that. Good. James has found you some vultures, so off you go. You hear that? Mm. Oh, 
so some vultures over there, everybody, in the dead tree, appropriately. That is what a vulture's lot in life is, is to be the harbinger of dead things. Now, were there to be a whole lot more of them, I'd say it was quite possible that there was a, an expired animal just below them being fed upon by perhaps a leopard. But there are just two of them there, and I know there is a nest close by. So I think that they are probably just resting on the tree there. And I'm just going to look with my very powerful binoculars whether they have a full crop or not. They don't seem to have full crops which says to me that they have not eaten too recently and therefore that there is not a carcass on the ground beneath them. Now, those are two white-backed vultures, and I know in the States we have, we've had some very interesting discussions of late of the different kinds of nomenclature for animals. And although we sort of speak the same language, we do have different terms for different things. And I think in the States you would probably call a bird like that a buzzard, whereas here we would call it a vulture. And appropriately, it is called a different thing in the States because it actually belongs to a different family of birds entirely. And while they do look quite similar to what you might call a buzzard, the New World vultures are actually much more closely related to storks than they are to our vultures. So it's an example of what's called convergent evolution, where animals in totally different parts of the world evolve the same strategies for living in similar conditions, but completely separately from each other. Speaking at all. Okay. I'm just having a few troubles with my earpiece. <laughs> Apparently, from these large white backed vultures, we're going to go back across to Scott and some little blackbirds jumping about in a tree. Oh, no! A southern black tit just hit the ejector seat and went flying out of that buffalo thorn tree that it was sitting on. We stopped to take a close investigation into this tree because initially the black tits were alarm calling, or at least it sounded like it to me, so they were getting a little bit worked up about something and I thought possibly a snake, possibly a mongoose, possibly some kind of predator, just like I spoke about earlier. The birds are incredibly useful when it comes to finding predators. Now, Seeing as though you are with us, the black tits have just landed in the tree behind us. Let's see if we can't get you a glimpse of them. Seeing as though they've got such a bizarre name, I'm sure a lot of you would like to actually see what this bird looks like. It's the one that you can hear calling. And we may just, ah, oh, they keep flying, but we should be able to get a view of them here now. It's not going to be the greatest, they're small little birds. It's in the top little portion of this tree here, Jean-André. Um, there we go. Well done. There you go, you little southern black tit, you. And very black body, white bars on its wings. Can't really be confused with any other birds of this area. Ooh. Well, yeah, there's a couple of them. And it appears like they're just having a happy family gathering. So maybe that's what the chittering and chattering was all about. Not necessarily for a steak, just for the enjoyment of the sunshine. Wonderful. flying around here that I'm trying to work on where they are. They're incredibly pretty birds that we'd like to try and show you. Hello, Brenda in Virginia. And you were watching Pete's pond camera yesterday and you saw a very brightly colored bird. I'm just going to need, uh, get ask Louise to run through the colors and description of that bird again for me. Beautiful emerald green plumage, long tail, yellow, white and red around the head. Whew. I wonder what it could be. 
European beer here, Jandre. Piglets. Ah, uh, uh, piglets. Okay, Jandre spotted some little warthogs. It's going to creep forward a little bit. Um, sure, I can't for the life of me think of an emerald green bird with a long tail with gr red and yellow around its head. I'm sorry, I just can't for the life of me think what that could be. Um, what I would suggest is maybe trying to tweet a screenshot of it if you took one. Oh, look at the tails up, off they go. There's mommy. Um, if you are, if you can try and tweet a screenshot and then Lou will be able to try and send that to me and then I can have a look at it. That will be the best way of trying to solve this because from your description, I am left baffled. But Pete's Pond is a long way away, so uh, it wouldn't be hugely surprising that it's a bird that we don't necessarily get you, and that's possibly why I don't know what's going on. Let me just roll forward a bit and see if we can't get a slightly better view of these piglets. With mommy, ah, oh, there we go. So she's done well, it looks like Four piglets are still alive. Now, well, what's interesting is that some people say that they can give birth to six. I'm not convinced about that. I believe that four is their maximum, but that's just me. And if I do see any more than four together, I'll assume it's from two different mothers. which could be the case, actually, because I think there is another mother lurking around you, unless there's an offspring from a previous litter, which also isn't hugely uncommon. Joe in New York, yes, it is fascinating how quickly the vegetation has responded to the Small rainfall we got a couple of nights ago. I think it was three or four nights ago. We got some decent rain, about 20 mils. And already there's been an injection of green. The leaves and all the bushes are looking far more turgid. And lush. And before the rain, things were looking very, very desperate. Just so this Warthog family is certainly enjoying the bounty and turnaround time of Mother Nature, she's got the vegetation looking incredibly good in a frighteningly short amount of time. Well, the action is happening here on Safari Live this afternoon. We are going to race you back to James now. There, everybody, is a rock or tree monitor lizard that David spotted running across the road. I was lost in dreamy daydream land, this beautiful sky overhead. David, thankfully, is on his game this afternoon. That's a young one, uh, and just young simply because they get up to uh, 130 centimeters in length. Now, that is the same as three foot three. No, it's not about three, well, it's almost four feet. So they get enormously large. And he's blinking his little eyes there. You can see his nictitating membrane going across his eyes. It's not the eye of many of these, but I think there are quite a few of them around the place. And their major enemy, of course, is the martial eagle, the largest eagle species that we get here. Incredibly formidable eagle. And it just goes to show that only the marshal is actually big enough and strong enough to take on one of these things when they're adult. They've got in very immense strength. You wouldn't be able to hold one as a human being. They would whip you really hard with that tail. They'd scratch you with those vicious claws and probably bite you as well. And they eat pretty much anything edible. And as I say, you can just see that nictitating membrane going across the eyes every so often. <laughs> there it is. And they will eat, they eat millipedes. They're one of the few animals that can eat millipedes, which um, are normally pretty toxic. They've got a whole lot of cyanide in their exoskeletons, but they are happy to eat those. Otherwise, they will eat basically anything that is meat-ish and smaller than them. Other lizards, perhaps small snakes, would probably try and catch nestling birds if they could. Ooh, look at him moving. Isn't he great? 
And like I say, they will bite readily if they're attacked. And Steph, as you say, the camera is spectacular. Of course, um, anyone, if I was behind the camera, you wouldn't have, it is largely the operator, of course, that is doing the incredible job of bringing you those amazing scales that you can see there. That's a fantastic shot. Look at those claws, aren't they vicious? He's watching us, but he thinks he's slightly confused as to whether he's hidden from us or not. And you can see, you can't really see, but on his back, he's got coloration that is very similar to the bark. And his belly, much like many of the animals out here, they tend to have pale bellies and most of the coloration on, the, on their backs or their ventral dorsal sides. And I think you'll find that has something to do with the fact that it is expensive for the body to produce the pigments that make those very distinctive markings. And therefore, it's sort of not really, there's no, not, no real point in making the bits of you that are normally seen the same color. This is the radio. I'm trying to get an update, but we still are not in range of anyone else. I don't, which probably means that there's not much going on on Arethusa itself. Isn't that spe special? Actually, the only other large or great rock monitor sighting I've had has been on Arethusa. Same thing, ran across the road. I think it was with Brian at the time, and he, no, it was VM, and he told me to stop quickly, and there it was. You can see it breathing. Look at that. We tend to think of these things as being very distantly related to us, or so distantly that it's almost unfathomable that they could be. But they've got lungs in the same way that we do. You'll find that the joints on that forearm are this pretty similar to ours. So you can see the wrist joint. You can see the five fingers, the five toenails or, or claws. So despite the fact that hundreds of millions of years of evolution have separated us, that basic design of four limbs and the internal workings are actually not that different. And if you compare the differences in, say, a millipede's structure to that of a spider, they are far more distantly related than we are to a reptile like this, and I just find that incredible. And the only other animal that this could be confused with would be a water monitor lizard, which tends to have much more distinctive dark markings, yellow and black. They don't have that distinctive Roman nose either. They've got a much more pointed nose. And of course, being water monitors, David, they are found around water. Well done, good. They, these ones are called rock or tree monitors and unsurprisingly are found in trees. Well done, David, yes, good. I'll just quickly show you a picture of a rock, uh, well, both of them. I'll show you the rock and the water monitor. Try and hide it from the sun there. How's that, Dave? There is the water monitor, and you can see a much more obviously pointed nose, different coloring. And there are rock monitor or tree monitor with his Roman nose. And as Louise says, it looks a little bit more like a crocodile. I suppose, yes. They have a different, interesting distinction from a crocodile, though, is that their legs... <laughs> I will get back to you. I'll tell you why I'm laughing now. But apparently, the difference, they have different legs and different arrangement of legs or limbs from a crocodile. A crocodile's limbs come out from the side, and that's why when it walks, it looks so very awkward. It looks like it's kind of moving along in an awkward fashion, and that helps it when it's in the water. These lizards' legs come much more from underneath them, and that allows them to move on land much more efficiently than a crocodile can. Steph says, apparently, they're very delicious. Um, I've never eaten a rock monitor, a tree monitor. I'm not sure that I ever shall, but I imagine they would taste, um, Dave, probably like chicken. I've eaten crocodile once before. That tastes like a mixture of fish and chicken. I wouldn't recommend it. 
desperate times and all that. Anyway, he will be basking pleasantly in the sun there, comfortably waiting, and of course, oh, look at that. High action here at the monitor sighting. He's moving around the tree. I think that's amazing. He's just, so I think he's almost trying to disguise himself from us in case we can see him. <laughs> right, I think let's move on. We're not far from the water. I'm gonna start the engine and just keep watching him there. Dave, I think he might move. No, he thinks we can't see him, you see. Mm. What a wonderful, wonderful sighting. Matthew, you are aged just nine, and you are possessed of an iguana, which is called Dyson, of course, after Scott Dyson. I think that is a brilliant name for an iguana. Um, I'm sure it doesn't have a beard quite as impressive as Scott Dyson's, but I think Dyson is a very good name for an iguana indeed, Matthew. And you want to know if they are related, or are there any lizards that are related? Well, I suppose that would be the closest relative that we have here. I would imagine the monitor lizards would be the closest relatives to your iguanas, but I don't think that they're very closely related, no, Matthew. You know, an iguana, as far as I understand it, is what we call a new world reptile. Now, the new world is described as is South America and North America, and the old world is basically everything else. And it's a strange way of describing the world, because, but it just comes from the fact that uh, Europeans first went to America sort of after they went to the rest of the world. That's why the distinction is called that. But what it means is, remember, that we are separated by the mighty Atlantic Ocean on one side. Well, that's what separates you from us. And then what separates you from the rest of the new old world on the other side is the mighty Pacific Ocean. And that means that the animals and plants that occur on either side, look at the squirrel there, the animals and plants that occur on either sides of those great bodies of water are often very different from each other. There's a little squirrel. He thought we hadn't seen him. And speaking of Scott Dyson, let us not forget, of course, that Scott was savaged by a squirrel in his sleep yesterday on his leg. Let him tell you about that now. <laughs> that was absolutely hilarious. Well, not at the time, but afterwards, Nikki cried herself back to sleep um, after the squirrel attack. I still kind of cannot believe that a squirrel would take a bite into a chunk of flesh that is so large. I mean, what was it thinking? Biting into my little hairy calf. Anyway, it sure did wake me up. Um, happy to hear that James found you what seems to be the biggest monitor ever recorded in the history of Safari Live. We are breaking boundaries today, or at least he is. So that's wonderful. You don't often get to see their whole body. Often it's just their head poking out of a hole. Now, what I'm tempted to try and show you is a 360-degree view of the beautiful clouds that we have in the sky and there's a little part of the road where i'm going to be able to do a full turn so let's start now jandre and i'll start turning when possible but let's so we're kind of looking to the north now and i'm going to continue to now turn the vehicle to the south beautiful clouds oh look at that now that's now getting more to the west. Now we're almost directly west into the sun, getting there. Beautiful, beautiful clouds in the sky this afternoon. So that's my, that's my comeback to James's monitor lizard. <laughs> quite cool. 
there is a scorpion that's been doing some housekeeping here. And I'm just going to jump out quickly to show you guys what's going on. So, here you can see a coin slot-like hole, um, horizontal, not vertical, and that makes sense as the scorpions have got very horizontal bodies. You can see over here this very kind of soft soil that's been ruffled up. This has been excavated from outside of the burrow, and along with it, there's a whole bunch of millipede exoskeleton rings. And this is one of the favorite foods of scorpions. These would all have been connected together when the millipede was still alive. The millipede could have been as long as this little branch that I'm on. So maybe this is just the remains of one millipede that the scorpion's been feeding on. Hard to say that, because they do vary in size from about an inch to about four, five, sometimes six inches in length, the big millipedes. So happy to know that there's a scorpion living down in this hole. And there are scorpions all over this ecosystem. Some that live on the ground, some that live in trees. And interestingly, they are seldom seen, so people don't really pay too much heed to them. But they are here in very, very large numbers, doing their bit, keeping the insect numbers in check. And I guess that's one thing that's so easy to, as us as humans to do. It's so easy to overlook things that you don't, do not see. But that's not to say that they are not there. Maybe after dark what I'll do is I'll use my UV torch or black light to shine on... Oh, well, James has now found the rock monitor's cousin. Can you believe it? Off you go. He's coming into frame. How cool is this, everyone? <laughs> there is a very large water monitor. You can see a much more pointed nose and obviously just next to the water here at Arethusa Dam. And he is chilled as Larry, walking across the road and enjoying the sun. <laughs> this is so cool. I've never seen two in the same day before. This one was also spotted by David. Isn't that amazing? Well done, David. Good job. I just want to make sure if his diet is any different from that of his close relative, and I think it is. I think you'll find that he eats a lot more aquatic stuff. Yes, he does. Crabs, frogs, etc. And there he goes. Very, very cool indeed. That is the water monitor and the rock monitor in one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Now, Rusty Pipe. <laughs> Rusty Pipe, you're on YouTube and you want to know if there are any venomous lizards here. Rusty Pipe, there are no venomous lizards. There are, I mean, think of a rock monitor bit you. You could get an infection probably from the bacteria in his mouth, given what they do eat. But nothing like, for example, that um, Komodo dragon of Southeast Asia, which bite, will bite you. And if you don't get medical help, uh, the bacteria and nastiness that they have in their saliva will eventually kill you. There is a hippo in here, believe it or not. And actually, Dave, there's a water monitor, if you can believe it, swimming behind the hippo. You see it there? It's stopped. It may may actually be a it may actually be a terrapin i think it is a terrapin oh and there's also dave there's a black crake you see the little black bird yeah. you've got him there that's a black crake everyone for those of you who are keeping lists i think you'll find that that's a bird that you haven't got on your list many of you will not have that bird a black crake i will find you a picture thereof that's very cool indeed. It's all happening here at Arethusa Dam. Crake, search. And there he 
There he is, yeah. Definitely a black crake. Very obviously so. There he is. Now I'll show you a couple more pictures. And that's him right there. In glorious technicolor, yellow beak, red legs, black body, red eye. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice black crake. And then, let me look there. Dave, there is a water monitor. You know whether you see the stick there, right? Yes. Got the stick. If you come back from the stick, it looks like a little bit of mud in the middle of the hyacinth. You see that right hand? That's it. Zoom in there. Down a bit. Down a bit. That's in there, right in the middle of the shot. That is a water monitor. Lying in the water hyacinth. <laughs> Very cool. Today is Water Monitor Day. So, Jen, on Twitter, you say you're loving these water monitor sightings or lizard sightings. I am, too. Beautiful. And then there's another little bird. If you just go up from there, Dave, you'll see him. And there he is. If you can, see, can you see him go right a bit? He's in there somewhere. He's a little three-banded plover. There he is, three-banded plover. Quite common, but also a nice one for the list. If though, for those of you who are new to keeping a list, I think those who've been keeping a list for a while will have the three-banded plover. But new, he might be too many of you. Hmm. Black crake, please let us know if the black crake is a new one for your lists. It would be great. And then to head across to Scott for another grey bird. Well, this go-away bird is showing us, or at least was showing us, just how hot it is when the sun bursts through that thin layer of wispy clouds we showed you earlier. It was panting heavily there, just like a dog. And now it's calling. Quang! Hence the name the grey go-away bird. Oh, there's another one here panting in this tree. Let's see if we can't get this. This one's trying to seek refuge in some shade, which it's doing quite well. Look at how quickly its throat is pulsing. High repetition panting. They really are cool birds, the go-away birds. And I think after this brief but quite steamy sighting, why don't you go and cool off with the terrapins and the monitor lizards back at Arathu's waterhole? In there. Up a bit. Up. Up. Now, there was another monitor. There was a terrapin, and there's also, in that pool, exactly where Dave's got his camera, there is a very large catfish. In fact, that shiny bit on the bottom end of your screen there is the back of a very large catfish. There, it's moving. <laughs> that is a massive catfish. It's probably about three or four feet across. Huge fish. I initially thought it was a snake swimming around, but it isn't. It's all happening over here. And then we did also spot a monitor swimming around. But I think we've lost him every day. I can't see him. Hmm. Day of the monitor. There's another back of a catfish you can see there. And there was a monitor swimming around there. And I wonder if they aren't all swimming around at the moment because there's so many more insects as a result of that rain. They would have landed in the water um, in an attempt to drink or, I don't know, probably just last night got exhausted and landed in the water. And that would have brought out the monitors and brought out the in turn brought out well, the frogs, and that would have in turn brought out the catfish and the lizards. Hmm. Okay, I think we'll probably press on from here now. I did see some tracks of a very large male leopard, but they look to be from last night. So we'll carry on. There, of course, is a hippo, uh, very shaded nicely, of course, in the hyacinth, but going to struggle now because he's not, he looks like he's in water there, He's actually largely in mud. Brilliant. On we go. So I hope you 
up a couple of new birds for those of you keeping lists. <laughs> what we'll do now is we'll head sort of slowly down to the south of Arethusa, then across past the airstrip and back towards Juma. I do want to go and see the hyena den. I think one of us will go and see the hyena den sometime during the afternoon just to see if that female who was attacked by those wild dogs is getting on okay. I'll be interested to know. Somebody said he thought that they were, that perhaps that hyena wasn't part of the clan, and that's why the rest of the hyenas didn't come and help her. I don't want to throw that out completely. I don't think it's true, but I'll be very interested to see when we get to the den if she is convalescing over there. But I'm only going to go there once it starts to cool down a bit. Tig, I think it was, that was asking if we were going to go to the den. Yes, we are definitely. One of us will go at some stage. Oh, Ted. Not Tig. Ted. Thank you, Louise. Sorry about that. Not much of a flush of green here, I must say. Now, the rain has been extremely localized over the course of the summer, with a little bit of rain that we've had. And so this area obviously didn't get as much as we got at Juma even though we're not much more than, I'd say only about four kilometers or three kilometers even, as the crow flies from where we live at Juma. Absolutely no rain here, hey? Look at this, it's completely kind of gray. That is fascinating. Let's, let's head across to, to Scott. He's at a water hole. I think there are two watering damsels there, but we'll get a, an update from him. Very good. I hope you enjoyed your dip in the water hole with the terrapins and the catfish and the monitor lizards. Interesting stuff. Now, We've just headed past Gallego Waterhole, small little pond in front of the one Juma camp. There was nothing to see there. And we are now going to continue up onto our northern boundary called the Buffelsook Cut Line. And check that carefully. I'm hoping that the wild dogs are going to start to think about getting up and moving. Who knows, maybe they already have. But what we're going to require is that they head south over our boundary into Juma so that we can have some fun playing with them this afternoon. Hey, you want to go to your visual bay? Can I join you? Yeah, Andrew, just come slowly. They're not going to punish you. Okay, you want me to wait or... Well done to Deborah and Tom, who enjoyed racking up two new birds for their... Whip it around there, Jean-Dre. To their bird list. Oh, maybe another one. Let me just swivel the vehicle, Jean-Dre. Sorry, I've left you with a terrible angle now. Oh, and I can't get the car in gear. Oh. Okay, it's... Too... Oh, no, it's gone. It was a black crown chagra. It's a bird we so often hear but so seldom see, and it was just perched out in the open there. Um, we'll get it, we'll get that one. But I'm happy that you guys got your extra birds with that gray-headed kingfisher earlier, even though it was a juvenile. It does count. And as we head east along Buffalo's Hook cut line in the search of the wild dogs, if we don't have any luck with them, we have got a plan B, which will be to try and find the black crown night herons, which is a bird that I've never seen at Juma in all my time here. But for now, we've got a comical little character sitting in the tree. Don't go anywhere. There you go. Oh, this to me looks like a youngster that would have been born this year. It doesn't have the pink coloration around the eye and the throat, which would be indicative of an adult, and it's also got a very small beak, so 
a young little hornbill. Very good. Oh, that's Johnny. Just what another another one there. No, good. Oh, they're moving about here. Yeah? You see, there's the pink around the neck and the, oh, the eye that I was talking about, indicating an adult bird. That looks like an adult female to me, possibly not very big, but this could be a whole happy family jumping around here, yeah, youngsters and adults. There they go, probably feeding on, oh, feeding on nothing, having a dust bath. Come on, carry on. That's one of my favorite things to watch is birds rolling themselves around in the dust, ruffling their feathers. It's an interesting cleaning technique, this, because who would think that rubbing yourself in dirt is going to help keep you clean, but it actually does. It helps them to get a little bit of grip and traction as they comb through their feathers with their beak, and that way the, the dust or fine bits of sand almost help remove little parasites that may be hiding in and amongst the feathers. And it looks like, according to Louise, that he's wearing a, a ponytail. And I agree, it's more of a ponytail than a mohawk, that little black strip that runs down the center of their head. I've never looked at it in that regard. So thank you, Lou, for opening my eyes up to these birds wearing ponytails. Now, one of you is suggesting that the bird that was seen at Pete's Pond that we're not sure of was a bee eater. I'm not convinced, um, but possibly. Um, let me just chat with Craig quickly. Afternoon, Craig. Uh, no news, my side, yet, sadly. I'm on Gallagher shortcut heading. I'm going to check Buffalo cut line from here east to see if the pack haven't crossed south. Thereafter, I'm going to be hunting the black crown night herons that you saw dodging me this morning. All right, um, Looks like Craig wants to have a long chat, so let's let's make the most of this. Uh, sorry, I missed the end of that. Um, and you, before you close down, did you pick up any other tracks for the Nkohumas? Uh, negative, Craig. The last tracks we had, or well, not we had, Taxon had, were going east away from the Gallagher waterhole. That's, that's the last. Thank you, sir. Copy, no problem. So, now, speculations that the bird scene could be a little bee-eater. It's got no red on it, so uh, green coloration, yes, but it's got a yellow throat. There's no red on it. The white-fronted bee-eater, maybe. Maybe it was that one. Um, not too sure, though. Um, like I said, I need to see a picture, just, uh, you know, a, a vague description like that um, can be useful. But it hasn't been in the case with me, so I'm gonna, like I said, I need to see a picture, and therefore we can start taking some calculated guesses as to what it is. Is otherwise we'll never get to the bottom of it, I guess. But bee eaters weren't far off. But there's not a red and yellow around the neck or head in the bee eaters that we get here. There might be a slightly different one that you get up there that fits that profile. Okay, well, James has just arrived at the Arethusa International Airstrip. Let's hope he's not booking a flight anyway, but why don't you go and see exactly what he's up to. Hello. Hello, everyone. Ow. Oh. I was rather hoping I might retrieve this red-billed buffalo weaver's nest. It has fallen out of that tree. But it's rather too full of thorns. Yeah. 
I thought I might just be able to kind of pick it up and bring it across, but it's rather too full of thorns. They're not always made of thorns. They're often made of just sort of dry twigs. That one has obviously been... The material's been sourced from acacia trees around here. It's very spiky. And it must have fallen out of that tree there, I suspect, during the last storm that we had. Anyway, there's nothing in it at the moment, but it is quite interesting in that although it looks just like a pile of sticks, it's very cleverly interwoven, and within it, there is a little grass section. So each pod in which the couples will live, they, it's like a sort of flat, if you like, a block of flats in which couples of birds live. Each little pod in which each couple lives is a sort of intricately woven bit of grass inside the protective thorn layer. It's really quite clever. I didn't realize that before. So many new things, David, every day. Yeah, Replug myself in. We are now on the Arethusa International Airstrip, and we will be driving to the south of it, and then back to Juma. Michelle in Michigan, you say that you're looking for the official name of the water monitor. Uh, well, the official name last I checked was the uh, water monitor. It might also be called a water legavan, but that would be a South African term which you won't find. I'll find you the Latin name now, and then you can look that up if you like. See how multitasking, David. It's called a water monitor, Varanus niloticus. So V A R A N U S V A R A N U S niloticus N I L O T I C U S N I L O T I C U S. I am reading and driving. Such is my skill. Venus niloticus. There you go, Michelle. Definitely called a water monitor out here. I'm not sure why you wouldn't find it. I don't know it by any other name. Except uh, that Legavan, which is a, well, it's a South African term. An Afrikaans term, which I don't think you'll find in common usage. Right, we're now at the very southern end of the traverse, where we're allowed to go. And of course, we have all tr trespassed by mistake every so often. I did follow a beautiful female leopard south of here one day and realized where I was until I popped out onto another road. Well, here's some fellow doing a high-speed chase, probably to an exciting sighting. Off we go then. Hello, yes, hello, you're on TV, smile. <laughs> uh, well, <there's> <laughs> I'm just heading off onto the triple M brake. Uh, copy. This is uh, A-Main. This is uh, Anathusa Private. Ah, sorry about that. I must have missed the turn-off. And as... Yeah, turn-off is um, the next one to leave. Um, I'm... I am 20, 20 metres beyond where I'm supposed to be. It was this road that I meant to take. <laughs> of all the times to make a mistake like that. I'm sure I've gone down that road before. That's, that, is, that is deeply, deeply embarrassing. Uh, it's this road that we're supposed to take, not that one. You heard him say there, wild earth come in. Go ahead. I thought he was going to tell me about an exciting sighting. Where are you going? to the triple M break. You are in the wrong place, not on this property. Fair enough, me reverse. That's so embarrassing. I've done this a hundred times along this road. Oh, now Gracie, you, you say, You've heard, um, you've heard Scott singing. Well, 
I mean, you've heard something that I never have, Gracie, and you say you'd like us to make a song together. Uh, Gracie? Look, I will suggest it to Scott, but the last time that we performed music together, he played the drums and I played the guitar, and he said to me, in no uncertain terms, that it would never, ever happen again. So I'm not sure we'll be able to convince him, but we can try, certainly. I was hardly far off track. I'm sure that fellow was being a little bit ungracious to me. So it goes. <laughs> right, Ashley, let me answer your question as I get over the embarrassment of that. Uh, you want to know about mimics, and are there any other animals that mimic things? Because lots of birds obviously mimic calls. Um, I'm not as far as I know, you know, actually. I think it is only birds that do very clear mimics. Well, human beings are obviously very good mimics of other animals, well, some better than others. Brian, of course, is a brilliant mimic. David is mute, and so he's not a very good mimic. Um, and <laughs> that's a bit unkind. He's not totally mute. He does speak every so often. Um, but in terms of mimicking sounds, I think it, the birds are by far the best at it. I suppose there might be, no, it's pretty much only the birds. And I mean, you, you get birds like those, um, uh, what are they called? The South Asian species. Oh, lyre birds, thank you, Louise, lyre birds. That will mimic exactly the shutter of a photo of a camera going. Ka-ching! They will mimic a chainsaw cutting the, the forest. And this is this iconic shot of David Attenborough um, filming, or certainly narrating over, a lyre bird that makes all the sounds of the forest. And then it started to make the sounds of the cutting of the chainsaw. And it's an amazing kind of profound moment where we realize that the lyrebird is actually singing of his own demise as we cut away the forests in which it lives. But lyrebirds, amazing birds at making different sounds. Okay, let's head across to Scott. I'm going to get off this long, straight, bumpy road. Hopefully see you on Juma. I might see you at Coral. Could be. We've just heard a rather a branch breaking or some kind of a loud snapping noise off to our right. It's incredibly thick. Maybe it's the lions chewing on a buffalo. Or maybe it's an elephant moving through this thick bush feeding as it goes. Or maybe a buffalo, something big. Hmm. This is one road that wasn't checked this morning, so I'm hoping the lion are just going to be sleeping in the middle of it as we come around the next corner. Or even better, rather, they come to us being escorted by a three-legged buffalo. That would be good. I haven't seen many three-legged buffalo around recently, though, so that's unlikely. Okay, James Richards, you are just like me, jealous, I guess, of Jandre's adventures into Madagascar and you would like to know what was the favorite animal that Jandre got to film while he was there. Now we have been discussing the various things that he's been filming and doing whilst there as well as in Australia but I haven't posed the question just like you have. Jandre, the chameleons, lemurs. Oh we need to send you across to James quickly. Oh. Sorry, there's a car there, but in front of the car is a pair of wild dogs. 
have just gone in here. There they go. They're just trotting through right. there. That's miles from... Nowhere near the other dogs where we were this morning. Do you see them there, Dave? Sorry, I'm just going to try and change this radio. This is making a beastly noise. There, I don't know, they just popped out on, on the road in front of us. I'm just trying to see if there are any others coming behind them. They don't seem to be. Now, we can't go in here after them. And this is a completely different pack, I think, from the others. They are miles and miles away from the other pack that we saw this morning. We can't go in there. Let's go around. They might pop out onto Juma. We're at quite close to a corner, and they are heading diagonally across this block. Dave, will you just keep an eye out behind us just to see if more don't pop out? I'm just going to give a quick update. Stations, two wild dogs heading across west, uh, sorry, east across Triple M at the Arethusa sign. I obviously can't follow them. Uh, they just seem to be on their own, two of them. I'm not copying, guys. I'm sorry you'll be able to hear me, but they went straight across Triple M in an easterly direction from the Arethusa sign. That's amazing. So what we'll do is go across here, let's get off this bumpy road, two wild dog sightings, two packs in a day. And let's just see if they aren't sort of heading in this direction and maybe they'll pop out onto the road in front of us. It's amazing. They must be looking for the rest of their pack, I'm sure. Fantastic stuff. Blind luck, of course, and the blind luck I haven't had for the last four days. All right, let's go down here. Hold on, David. Now, I imagine that they would pop out probably about 300 meters or so up ahead here about a thousand feet if they're going to pop out at all. They were walking quite slowly as you saw, but I think it's going to be worth just standing by here quickly. There's another channel that I can check on the radio. There's some Impala. They don't look to be looking very terrified. And of course, if Impala sees a wild dog, it will just run. It will not bother to shout, it will not bother to complain, it will just run. Drive very slowly through here, and we must keep looking behind us, of course. Quite interesting, interesting what Deborah Armchair Traveller says there. She says, um, <laughs> well, no, basically, I think she's saying because of the events of the afternoon, we've managed to bring you wild dogs again. Basically, if I hadn't uh, made that mistake, wasted those extra two seconds reversing and then turning onto the road, I'd have missed those dogs, gone straight past them. Absolutely astounding. Now, there's a road here, and I wonder if they're not going to pop out on it. It might be worth just standing by over here. I'm not sure. Oh, that's a horrible, 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 horrible noise. Sorry. What we'll do is just um, check the road and just keep looking behind us and see if they don't cross. Darwin, keep looking into the, into the bush there. I think they were heading pretty much to this direction, but they may have turned sort of due east. 
All right, let's head across to Scott, because I think this will be a little bit boring unless we find them. Let's go across to him, find out what he's doing, and I'll keep you posted if we see them again. Well, what a surprise that was. I don't know if it's the same pack that was seen this morning or different members thereof. They would have traveled a long way to get to where James just saw them from where we are expecting to find them now, if it is the same pack that he saw. So interesting stuff. And let's hope that they come back onto Juma. Sorry, James, I didn't get to finish answering your question regarding what Jandre's favorite things to film were over in Madagascar, and apparently the eye eye, a nocturnal primate, was one of the highlights. It's the world's largest nocturnal primate that's got this bizarre finger with incredible abilities that allowed to detect little grubs and branches, apparently. And it's also apparently the reason why that that species is highly endangered is because people believe if it points that funny finger at you, you will die. So they get killed. It's an unfortunate superstition that the local Madagascan people have. He also filmed a chameleon laying eggs, which took seven hours, shortly after which she was consumed by a snake. Crazy. That was another thing. A tiny chameleon, smaller than your nails on your fingers, called a Bukisia. Bukisia. Tiny, tiny little chameleon that he got to see. Lots of different snakes. The leaf-tailed gecko. Madagascar certainly is a country with some incredible endemic species that only occur there. Sadly, though, it seems like their conservation strategies are not so sound and Compared to Jandre's last trip there, um, there is less and less habitats available for a lot of the wild animals of Madagascar, and it doesn't seem like that problem is getting any better. So that's the sad reality of it. The moral of the story is, I guess, you've got to go and experience these places while they still exist, or try your best to be able to curb the damage that us humans are causing to the planets, which there's many ways, I guess. Just recycling in your own home is something that would be an easy start that everyone could do. Oh, we have a Cape Buffalo in front of us in the road. Maybe if we're lucky, it's the three-legged individual I was hoping to see getting chased by the Kahumas. I'm now on It is a beautiful evening, very nice to have the sun out. It's been cloudy for the last few days, so really enjoying this sunshine together with the lick of green that we've got after the rain. From Hello, Buffalo. Okay, just heard something's been found. It could be a wild dog or the lion. I'm just going to double check. Craig, sorry, what was that there? Uh, a couple of long necked camels at Hard to Call. Okay, copy that. Thank you. But <laughs> it's merely that I cannot uh, see them from the boundary that causes my lack of excitement. <laughs> so, there's some giraffe, which Craig has called long-necked camels, that have been found, but not where we can go, hence my lack of excitement. Hello, Cape Buffalo Bulls. Have you seen the lions anywhere? It's not looking like you guys are awfully worked up, but to be honest, had they have seen those lions 20 minutes ago, I don't think their behavior would be very different to what it is now. They command a lot of respect, these big old boys. Let me just roll forward a bit for you there, Jandre. And have had many 
an encounter with lions before. They're probably going to be more happy about the fact that there's some green grass to chew on than anything else at the moment. Very, very good. Let's leave these big old boys to carry on grazing. I want to try and get to the Buffalo Quarter Hole so that we can start the search for the black crowned night herons. But wait a moment first. What is that bird sitting in the dead tree down there, Jean Andre? Hmm. It is a vulture. Huh. It's holding its wing out very strangely. I don't know why it's doing that. Let's go and take a closer look there. I don't think there's necessarily any food below it, but hopefully I'm wrong. If there was, we would probably see more than just one vulture here, but you never know. Maybe just one vulture was lucky enough to see the Inkuhuma pride with their buffalo killed down in this little riverbed. But on top of that, I'm interested to try and work out what's going on with its wing. Maybe it's just resting it in a strange position, but usually they would do that after they've had a bath, usually at the water's edge, or they'd be doing it facing towards the sun almost to warm up sometimes. They'll do that when it's cold. I'm hoping this individual, I mean, I doubt it's injured. Otherwise, how would it have got up there? What is happening with your wing? Now, it appears like the left wing to me is being held as it should normally. You can see how the top tip of that wing is close to the bird's beak. Look at the other wing and how far away it is from the bird's beak. So, I don't know. I don't, can't for the life of me even have a guess as to what it's doing. Let's see if we can get around onto the other side of it. to pull it back into a regular kind of position now. So maybe it just had a long flight, had some turbulence, got its wing knocked around a little bit. Beautiful. Look at those clouds. For this one. I keep creeping forward a little bit so that its beak is not connected to that branch. There we go. I'm well, very happy that he has, he or she has not decided to fly off. Because we are very close to it, so. A very welcoming vulture as far as vultures go. Any sign of the lions when you're flying around today, mister? You don't speak English. OK. All right, well, we'll carry on then if you can't help us. Thank you, though, and glad to see that your wing is not broken. Very good. James has found a tortoise. Enjoy. Starting. Three. 
This, everybody, is the very largest leopard tortoise that I have ever seen here. And he's so old that he's losing the outer covering on his shell. And I can only think that that's perhaps because the shell has stopped growing. Now, I'm lying next to him so that you can see how large he is in comparison to me. He's not very shy. Normally, of course, when faced with the terror that is my face, they normally disappear inside. He's hissing at me, he's going <sighs> Isn't he wonderful? And this is a very big leopard tortoise. You know, they say they live to over a hundred years old, so I wonder how many seasons, how many droughts that this tortoise has seen. How many droughts have you seen, tortoise? Many, he says, too many to count. What I would very much like to try and do is put my microphone next to his mouth and see if you can't hear uh, him. Audio issue, James. We're not hearing you for some reason. Uh, it's because that thing is not out. Uh, Andrew, do you still have a visual of my fuzzy angle? Sorry, that. Sorry about the radio there. Yeah, affirmative. Uh, for the visual. <laughs> I'm just heading to these uh, and I'm going to come back. Right, you should be able to hear me now, everybody. I hope that's a bit better. Should be receiving me now. Are you receiving me now? <laughs> Luckily, the tortoise is not a fast-moving tortoise. One, two, right. one, two, testing. David, is that better? There we go. OK, now, what I'm going to do is just take the microphone off here next to his mouth and I want you to listen to it he goes <sighs> oh, be not afraid to toys did you hear that Stop coming for your you would have heard him going <sighs> oh, isn't I'm that cool Go ahead. <laughs> but otherwise That's he's very uh, confident and I mean the only thing that is going to harm a tortoise like this, I suppose, would be a ground hornbill. They would be the only things that have the bill or equipment to get into this shell. Absolutely fantastic. There he goes. Look at his wonderful head. Ah, he's leaving. He's had enough of this. I just wonder if he hasn't even... He couldn't have stopped growing. He's probably also, you know what, I think that his shell is probably that colour. Sorry about the radio, everyone. I think his shell is probably that colour because he's been through a fire or two. And what the fires do is they do tend to knock off that outer layer of the shell where the colouring is, where the brilliant disguise on the shell is. Okay, thanks. Um, he's not a slow tortoise, that. He's quite a fast tortoise. He would definitely have beaten the hair. Wasn't that cool? It's the day of the reptile. Let me turn the radio off. Sorry about that. There he goes. Okay, let's go down to Treehouse Dam, have a look what's going on there. I must remember to take this out, of course, when I get out of the car. Sorry about that, Luis here. Am I plugged in? I am plugged in. <laughs> Our treehouse dam does have a little bit of water in it, and those dogs were sort of heading in this general direction. I don't think they're going to pop out here, though. I think they were heading more east. But maybe the rest of the pack came up towards the dam towards the middle of the day. Who knows? I haven't heard them called in on any of the other channels. OK, let's go across to Scott, get an update from him. I'll keep you posted. We've just hit the jackpot. Look at this. It's not one, but two. A 
African scops owls. Can you believe it? Look at how well camouflaged they are. I bet some of you are still battling to even see them. Sorry, let me just chat with you, hun, quickly. Last week, uh, Saturday night. Can you believe this? This is a bird that I've very, very seldom managed to show you guys. Um, and it could well be a first. We called you across here in the hope that we're going to find these black-crowned night herons nearby. No, uh, not the recent Saturday, the one before. <laughs> I was just updating you, there as to when last we've seen Karula, which, as you heard, was quite some time back. So, you get two different types of scops owl. You get the African scops owl and the southern white-faced scops owl. This, to me, looks like the African scops are, although I can't really see the face clearly, so maybe I'm wrong. No, it is the African scops are. Let me try and reposition the vehicle. Let me try and reposition the vehicle a little bit to get you a more front-on view there. Stay zoomed in if you don't mind, John Red, so I know when to stop. Fast to sleep, not even concerned about us. They look like little tree stumps, and I wonder if one is a juvenile and one is an adult. Um, we see these birds so seldomly that I'm going to have to double check a few things here. Yeah? Those little ear tufts are. Wonderful little addition to their interesting anatomy. No, these are the white-faced scops owls, not the African scops owl. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you the picture in the book quickly. They're not going anywhere. Um, this is so cool. Now, obviously, we can't see its eyes because their eyes are closed, but here you can see they've got big orange eyes. We have been able to see that kind of black flecking on their chest and also that black, black ring around the outside of their eye. And here's a few more pictures. There's the ear tufts you can clearly see. There's a nest. I see a nest in that tree, that would have been a real bonus. And there's the eggs in the nest. How cute they are, tiny little owls. That's one thing that I haven't told you. Their total length is about, according to here, 27 centimeters. So very, I mean, even that seems a bit big for me. They don't seem that big to me. They seem a bit small. They seem about 20 centimeters to me. So very, very small little owls. Take another look. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the African scops owl out afterwards to show you a picture of that. Diane, you've just mentioned that you love the sound of the African scops owl. And Interestingly, the call of this bird is not the one that you're thinking of. You're thinking of the African scop sow, which goes kurr, 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 every kind of five seconds on average. This, the white-faced scop sow, has got a very different call, more of a kind of bubbling notes is what my app suggests is a good way to describe it. I don't want to play that call now. I will be able to play it once we drive off for you. 
um, but considerably different to that of the African scopsaw that we hear more commonly. Maybe that is the Navy sonar sound that you're talking about. Maybe not. What a bonus. How cool is that? Okay. Matty, you say it looks like the Tootsie Pop. I think we don't get Tootsie Pops here, but it's some kind of something you get in America that has an owl. Need to get you back to James with a raptor hunting. That's a tawny eagle, and we were alerted to its presence, everybody, by a white-crowned shrike that it's calling. You can hear it going, kick, 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 kick. You see it there, Dave? In the middle of the picture. Yeah. You've you got him. Now, we know he's a tawny eagle by the fact that he's so scruffy. You can see he's quite a scruffy eagle, and from the fact that his wings are a slightly different color. They've got blotching on them. Slightly different colour from the rest of his body. And I was alerted, like I say, to his presence by that white crowned shrike, hoping perhaps there was a leopard walking around, but not. It is that rapturous bird. Wonderful that you had the scopsile sighting. I've yet to see one here. I've heard them, of course, all the time, but I've yet to actually see one here. Ah, white faced scopsile, sorry. Their call, lovely call of the summer evenings. Very owl like. Just keep looking. This is very cross. White crown shrike. We're just going to look around here, see if we can't see any tracks of the leopard. My plan now is to head slowly, slowly, probably towards the hyena den. In the meantime, let's go back to Scotty's at Bullshook Dam. So, sadly my phone's playing up, so I can't play the call of the white-faced scopsile. Um, But maybe James will be able to do that for you on his phone, which is in working order, I believe. Now, we search for the black-crowned night herons. They were sitting in some Tamburti trees this morning before they flew off. They could do the same thing again if they are back in these trees, or they could be elsewhere. You wouldn't believe it. Take a look over to our right, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Surprise. How did you guys get here without any of us seeing your tracks? You're crossing over some very difficult roads. And looks like you may have snacked on something. You're breathing quite heavily. Is it a full belly or is it simply the heat? Stations, the Inkohumas are at Buffalo's Hook. Rions, big rions. And it looks like just four of them for now. No, I'm joking, it's just the uh, Nkuhumas, there's four of them that I can see. Okay, let's get into a better spot. There you can see three, the fourth one's just behind. bush over there but let's get into a bit of spot so we drove in and I was so focused on everything that side hoping to see these birds that we drove straight past the lion now we were here this morning but they definitely weren't here I know that for a fact maybe they were further off in some thick bush thankfully though they've poked their heads out and now we get to enjoy the last portion of the drive with them Ladies. Well, they're all panting quite heavily, and I 
suppose that they are fed on something. Go ahead, Johan. The Inkohuma Lioness, four of them are at Buffalo Dam. Okay, thanks, copy that. Can I make my way there? Yes, make your way. Yes, Scott. Now, great news no, for them. I'm very interested if we can take three more words. Yep, keep coming, Andrew. Just uh, letting the guys know that they can three. keep making their way here. Yeah, you guys have definitely had something to eat since last night. I wonder what it was. Now, it's great news for them, as I was saying, but obviously not the best news for us because we didn't see any of the action, and now it looks like they are going to sleep for the entirety of the rest of the safari. But we may get lucky and see them going down for a drink. I'm guessing, though, that they would have come here for a drink earlier, had a drink, and then come back and lay up in the shade. So... I think they've already done that at some stage today. Well, they don't seem too happy with the amount of food they've eaten. It's a mistake lions often make, but they need to because they compete quite ferociously amongst one another when there is food on the table. It's phenomenal to see how kind and caring they can be when there's no food, but how drastically that all changes when it is time for dinner. And that is why they will often eat themselves into a state of discomfort. Okay, well, while they sleep here, I want to just go and see if we can't find these black crown night herons. We're just around the corner. We will be back, fear not. But well, I just feel in their current state, we can possibly try and make the most of this beautiful last little golden light that is coming through. Look at that. Beautiful. Now, we may lose signal here, but we need to go here in order to try and find the herons, which were just sitting up in these trees this morning. There was two of them, a happy couple. Sadly, no immediate sign of the night errands. Let's just sneak through the other side here. If we don't have any luck, we will send you across to James, who has got some kind of a trick up his sleeve for you. Something. Jeez, this is going to be difficult, John. If you follow the main right hand beam to where my finger is there is sitting there. Look at those colours. On the right a little bit where I'm shining the spotlight, you can see that little... Oh, you had full zoom. The night heron is sitting there on that branch. You can just see its eye looking at us. It's not easy to see at all. Let's try and get you a better view of it. 
I'm going to have to just turn off the spotlight. It's in the center of where that spotlight is. You can just see a little black dot there, maybe. We've stopped on a very awkward angle here, which is making Genre's life tricky. Um, and the light is terrible. It's right behind us. But let's see if we can't sneak you guys into a slightly better spot. it goes. We are going to get you, Night Terran. You can fly, but you cannot hide. You may have got a glimpse of it there. Let's try and see if it's not on the other side here. The landing may have landed back in the tree where I initially saw it this morning. Secretive little creatures, these night errands. I guess that's because they're used to being out at night. Kind of makes sense. You can't blame them, really. It seemed like it swooped down and landed somewhere here. Oh, you! Look at it. Look at how cool that is. Oh. Well done, John Dray. Let's race up and see if we can't get you another view. Oh, cool. I'm going to show you guys in the book in a little bit. Maybe it's going to have landed at the water's edge. It's that stage of the, of the evening. Maybe it's happy to go hunting now. Yes. It's in the middle of the water hole. Look at how awesome this bird is. The black crowned night heron. Bright red eye, yellow legs, and it's got this long kind of streamer that grows down from that kind of ponytail, you could almost say. And the good news is it did have a mate here. So there are two of them in the area and they would have arrived just after we got these rains here i don't think they've been hanging around a barren dry water hole what i'm going to do is because genre is at full zoom we're not going to be able to get you much closer to it than what you viewed it there just going to show you a picture of it in the book Beautiful. Well, it really is turning into a magical evening here. Here it is. And I'm sure it's got a lot shorter legs than a lot of you are expecting. The other herons and the majority of the herons that we do see have got long legs, long necks. But this one, very short legs, very stumpy body, the bright red eye. And then here are these two funny, like, kind of, I don't know if you can call it a ponytail, but these two kind of streamers that grew out the back of it said, you may have vaguely been able to see that from the view that we had earlier. Let's see if we can't creep up and just get you one slightly closer view of it. I hope Michael in Florida is watching this. He is our lead ornithologist regarding his bird list. And I feel that you would not have got this one just yet, Michael. stealthy of creeping. There we go. This should be considerably better than our last view. Ah, much better. Wonderful. Well, I didn't expect it to work out this well for us. You got to see it flying around in our perch stationary, right out in the open. And to celebrate, we are going to now 
get back out from where we came, leave this little night here into its own devices, and show you a magnificent sunset that is unfolding. Magical. Oh, interesting. There's even a vulture perched up in that tree over there. Maybe it's aware of the scraps just in the, the corner of this tree here somewhere. There it is, y'all. So, oh, magical. Look at those colors of vultures silhouetted. Possibly this vulture did get to understand exactly what the Inkuma lions killed. And who knows, maybe there's still some meat there that they're going to head back to. Time will tell. We are going to send you over to James now and get into position with the lions for when you return to us. We've just arrived at the Hyena Den, everyone. I'm not sure what's going on. Two adults here, no babies out at the moment. One of them going towards the den, perhaps to call out the youngsters. I haven't seen, I don't think, the obviously injured one from this morning. Unusual that they're not all out at the moment. I wonder if maybe some of them have moved. I don't know, I don't know. Here comes one here. This, I think, is that, not the one that was injured. Let me just get into position here. That's Madam, who's just arrived. Yeah, 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 yeah. here we go. No, that's not the one who was injured either. They've obviously all been lying in the water during the course of the day. The one who was injured, I mean, she had chunks taken out of her backside. None of this lot have had any trouble like that. Here come the little ones. So that's Madam there, that's the matriarch there. The big one in picture. I think this is a male, is it not? I th think this might be a male. Yeah, it is one of the males. It is one of the males. Didn't get himself into the fray today. Left that to the ladies. Wise fellow, wise fellow. There's a huge activity going on here. Madam the matriarch pulling her youngsters out. Maybe the other female is. And as Louise says, Madam has been enjoying a spa day, lying in the mud, probably maybe a little bit injured after today's fight. But definitely that scar-backed female who was bitten to pieces by those wild dogs today is not here. I must just say, while we watch what unfolds here, that Scott First of all, even knew that there were black crowned night herons, white crowned night herons there, black crowned night herons, sorry, at Bifflesook Dam and then found them is absolutely astonishing. Hmm. 
Here's the male greeting them. Now, our beard, you're wondering about the injured hyena and if it would rest inside the den and be looked after. It won't be looked after, but it won't, and it, it won't rest inside the den. It will do neither, but it would often come and rest around where the others are. So I would imagine that wherever this lot have been swimming in the mud, the injured one is probably in the same place and may well come back to this area now to have a bit of a rest. Oh, you know what, we can going to be able to sex these things now. Let's check quickly. All right, the one behind, I think, is a male. The one underneath the mother now, I think that's a male. My binoculars weren't so utterly pathetic. Worried about stepping over that zizzy foot. Yeah, that's a male. It's definitely a male. So we've got at least one male there. While I try and sex the other one, the lions are up. Let's go back to Scott. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I've got no comms with final control. Why? I'm not too sure. Anyway, that's not a train smash. These lioness all picked up their heads in unison and started looking out to the east. There was other lion audio coming from there. It was even audible to us. I'm guessing maybe a mile away. Hard to be certain. It's something that I find very difficult to pinpoint as lion audio and where exactly it's coming from. But there are lions calling somewhere nearby. So... That's some good news, I guess. I was hoping that they were going to themselves start calling back to those lines. Possibly they're the Birmingham boys that were calling. Who knows? But it would have been wonderful if they did start singing out for us. Could happen a little bit later. Let's wait and see. I'm gonna try and I'll fix my comms issues which is going to be tricky. So, Lou, if you do want to go back to James, that would actually be kind of useful while I try and get the comms sorted. So, everyone, don't be surprised if you find yourselves in a different change of scenery now. Now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, those are both two little males, and I'd love to know from all of you who have been watching these hyenas for a long time, whether you agree with me or not. They have the pinched edge to their penis, and I think that is definitely an indicator that the two of them belonging to the matriarch are male and would be indicative of why they've survived, both of them. And then there's another young male that's just arrived. Amazing stuff, astonishing, flipping um, social structure that they have. It really is just amazing. Let's see who else arrives during the course of this evening. We obviously won't be here after dark. Quite a stink coming over, over the air now. The matriarch was scent marking with an anal gland. which has a very powerful smell. And now settling down to have a bit of a suckle. I'd be interested to know which water they've come from. It's not the Galago pan, which is quite close by to here. They've come from the opposite direction. I'd also be very interested to know where Corky is because her youngsters are obviously still inside the hole in this den unless she's moved them. It's just possible. Now, Iggy, as I said that I thought maybe... Well, I don't know. That's, I'm just guessing because Corky's not here and her youngsters haven't popped out and they have often been out here on their own even. 
And Iggy, you say, if one moved den, den sites, would they visit each other? Would they hunt together? They'd certainly forage together, absolutely. That would happen. Uh, whether they'd visit each other and go and have tea and scones, I'm not sure. I don't think so. You know, I don't think they'd make the effort to go across and say hi. But they do live in the same territory. They would absolutely recognize each other. Dave, I'm going to try and sneak a little bit forward. Get us a slightly better view. All right, back to the lions with Scott. They're getting up. Well, the other lions that we heard roaring all earlier have just roared again. And one of these ladies let off one grunt. Ooh. But didn't continue singing. She could well at any stage, but it certainly has got these ladies up. I wonder who it is. Maybe, just maybe, we're going to get to see them meet up with the Birmingham boys. That would be an incredible way to show a lot of you the Birmingham boys for the first time. The new viewers who have been here since kind of Christmas wouldn't have seen them, as I think the last sighting we had was on Christmas Eve, the morning of Christmas Eve last year. So it's been quite a while since we've seen the big dominant males of this area. And it looks like these ladies may be preparing themselves for that meeting right now. And this is the cute, caring, cuddly side of lions that fascinates me because they can be so gentle and tender when they desire. But like I said, even with one another, come dinner time, they will put away this caring and cute friendliness that we're seeing right now and lash out at one another to try and get the best possible portions of, of food. Um, I'm trying to look back to see where the other lioness is going. She may have better down to the water's edge. I can't see her though. I'm thinking of possibly joining Johan and trying to work out what she has done. Half of me is also wanting to go and try and look for those other lions that are calling. It could be close enough to us that we could actually find them. But Andrew, another guide, has headed off in that area. So we could get lucky. This is Amber Eyes. This is the one lioness that I can tell apart with relative ease from the others. She's got those burning amber eyes. Others are a little bit more tricky for me. It looks like they are all going down for a drink. So let's go and join them. there. Look at that, everyone. Absolutely magical colors in those clouds as the sun begins to set. Wonderful. Oh, we've interfered in a lioness's toilet stop here on our right. Oh, and it stinks. We are downwind of her and Ugh, that is horrible. Not the best consistency poop I've ever seen a lion deposit. That is not regular. Maybe they were chewing on a rancid item of prey. And she has now blocked our route. Ugh. Not very pretty. Let's scoot along past and get into spot. We'll just let her escort us down to the water hole. It looks like the other ladies are going to be following behind us. What I'm going to maybe try to do is actually get onto the opposite side of them in the hope that we can have the sunset behind them for some stunning shots. So hold on as I try and rally us into a decent spot. Oh, I think we might be in the money here. Look at 
that. There's some other guests enjoying this beautiful scene. The lions taking a sip at the waterhole with that bright, bright pink sky. Now that we have captured that moment, so I'm probably going to just slip alongside these lines to give Jean-André some better angles to work with. expecting us to see these ladies in action this evening, considering how heavily they were panting earlier, but it appears like the other lion roaring nearby have caused them to rally themselves and get active a little bit sooner than we expected. The blacksmith lapwing is calling in the background. Chip, 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 chip. I'm just going to keep quiet for a few moments as we enjoy watching these ladies take a drink. There is a chance you may even be able to hear them. that we're all very lucky to be experiencing. Oh, well, the blacksmith Lapman really got excited. That was it calling there. It's crescendo. Dr. Debbie, you've said you are terrible at judging the animal sizes over the screen. And Debbie, I think it's very difficult for everyone, not just you, to be able to judge the animal size when not being here in person. So don't be too hard on yourself. You would like to know if these ladies will outweigh me. And yes, I weigh about 80 to 85 kilograms, depending on how many ice creams I've been eat eating in the recent times. And I guess that's about 180 to 200 pounds, roughly. And they will weigh more than that. Oh, a pearl spotted owl, it's calling. That was the pearl spotted owlet. Um, so yes, Dr. Debbie, these ladies are going to be considerably heavier than me. They should, on average, weigh anywhere between 100 and 120 kilograms. So considerably larger than me. Looking at them, though, uh, it's hard to compare our anatomy in terms of weight to theirs because our body is in such strange portions. OK, well, it looks like the ladies are relaxing, and James has found you a wonderful view that he would like to share, so off you go. Everybody, I just wanted to quickly show you an incredible scene of a sort of volcanic look, uh, or volcanic colour sinking behind the Drakensberg there. You have the lions drinking in that incredible light, and I'm going to send you straight back to them now. But just look at the colour there. Isn't that unbelievable? 
That is the magnificent Dragon's Back or Drakensberg Mountains, the Hutzpreit dubious settlement uh, nestling in the shadows. Let's go back to Scott and the lions. And while you were gone, you'll notice we would have repositioned the vehicle ever so slightly. I had one or two tyres actually in the buffles or quarter hole to try and get the right angle, which I feared we may have got stuck in, but thankfully our trusty jigger got us out. I really do hope and feel confident that these ladies are going to call for us tonight. With those other lions calling nearby, I'm feeling very hopeful. Maybe it's the missing member of their pride. You'll get to see them reunite. Hello to Doretta, who I think may be joining for the first time. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, Doretta. You like to know the ages of these line, and it's difficult for me to say. Um, I would say, though, that the oldest lioness who's got a very pale face in comparison to others that we'd obviously battle to see now because they're all facing away from us. But I'll put her at around eight years of age and the youngest probably around three to four years of age. So uh, mixed ages. There is also a fifth member of this pride, but she is missing at the moment. And what? Looks like this one might have a fur ball that she might be trying get it, to get rid of. She doesn't seem too comfortable. <laughs> Let's see if she can't get comfortable. Hello, Dylan in Cedar Falls, Iowa. I think you may be watching in between your university lectures. What a great way to spend your free time between studying. You'd like to know why they all lined up to drink together. And it's the same reason why we see them all flopping around together now. They are highly, highly social cats, the only social cats really in the world. Most other cats, doesn't matter where you go on the planet, will not form big social groups like lions do. Occasionally though, it must be said that coalitions of male cheetah are formed. That's the only example I can think of out of the African cats. Other than that, usually they're solitary, but lions are different. And this behavior that you can see here, is confirming that and that's also why they just like to do things together it's i guess like you going to a pub with a group of your friends and hire renting a table together as opposed to going to the opposite ends of the bar those two stopped and pricked up their ears but the other two have not so it would have been interesting to know what caught their attention but had no impact on the other two it was in the opposite direction to where we heard those other lines vocalizing now. The other lines are vocalizing. I don't think it's on Juma. I'm fairly confident it's further north and possibly even east of where we are. Hello, Mr. Moustache who is watching in Iceland. I hope to come and visit you there one day, Mr. Moustache. That sounds like a very interesting part of the planet. You like to know if lions are scared of water, or dislike water, rather, is probably a better word. I think I don't think you use the word scared. Um, yes, they, lions of the Sabi Sands are not interested in getting their paws wet. Only if they have to cross a river for a very good reason will they get their paws wet, but they will never lounge in water like tigers would, which is strange. I mean, you can't help but wonder why they don't, because it would certainly keep them cool, and especially considering that the lions of Botswana and other areas of Africa will become very comfortable with moving through the water. Jean-Louis, let's see if we can capture this. There's a nightjar that's come over the water here, and it's drinking. It's it's quite a, it's just moved off, that might come back. It's quite a slow moving, here it comes back, Jean, from right, left to right. It's quite a slow moving bird, so we should be able to capture it, relatively speaking. Oh, well done, Jean, -Ray. look at this. Oh, imagine being able to just swoop down and take a sip like that so casually. 
Jean-Dre made that look a lot easier than it was. I'm going to ask you while you're across there, Jean-Dre, to just also show one more thing. And that is the, the night here, and it's at about 10 o'clock. I'll use my spotlight just above it. Just below where my spotlight is, it should give you enough light. And it's busy hunting. This is the black crown night here that we saw earlier. And now we get to see it in full hunting mode. Look at that. Poised and ready to send that sharp beak plummeting into the water after, I'm guessing, frogs in this case, or tadpoles. Oh, there's the blacksmith lapwing in the background. That's the critter that made the noise early on when the lions were moving. Oh, we found something to snack on there as well. So the birds are upstaging the lions at this stage. Having said that, though, the lions have just popped, popped, popped their heads up again, so let's take a look at what they're up to. So yes, Mr. Moustache, basically some lions in certain parts of Africa will become accustomed to water and more comfortable with it, like the lions of the Okavango Delta in Botswana. But the lions here of the Sabi Sands are not interested in getting wet. Look at that ear twitching to try and keep the flies at bay. They will continue to pester these lions. I wonder where you guys are going to head to from here. That's going to be interesting to see. I'm hoping they don't go too far and they're somewhere on Juma so we can try and track them down tomorrow morning. But what I hope more than that is that the Birmingham boys come and visit them. And also just check in on Juma. This is a portion of their territory that they do need to come and make sure there are no intruders or imposters. But who knows, maybe before the end of the safari they will get active. For now though, you guys are about to get active and head across onto James's vehicle. Hello everybody. We're just driving along the road at the moment. We have uh, seen a marvelous sunset. We went to Bilzog Dam to see if we could find a bump or two. See if we could find anything there. Not Bilzog Dam, obviously there's lots of Bilzog Dam. We just went to Sydney's Dam to see if there was anything there. I was hoping those dogs had maybe popped out, but they didn't pop out there at all. There were some water buck who were standing there looking a little bit sort of bemused by the state of affairs. I'm not sure why. Uh, perhaps they too listened to the state of the nation address last week. Week. Oh, be quiet. Very noisy radio this afternoon. Anyway, it's become slightly too late to look for the dogs, and that's simply because it's got dark and we don't want to disturb them at night. They're not nocturnal predators, and just amazing that those lions popped up at the dam there. I just I can't believe that. We didn't see one track of them today, not one. And that's I mean, I don't suppose that, I suppose that says, doesn't say much for our tracking, but Taxon was out here, a tracker on his vehicle, so did Aubrey, and they also didn't see any track. So I think what they did was sneak across uh, from Gallego Camp. I think they snuck across the road towards where we've actually watched them the last few mornings, the last time we've seen them. And then they just sort of, well, I don't know, almost flew towards Bivolzog Dam. There are roads in between, very few. One of them is Hyena Road, which is almost impossible to see any tracks on, so maybe that's what happened. Must have been what happened. I'm most pleased that they popped up. I'm now, of course, going to go to Bilzog Dam and look for those black crown night herons every time I go anywhere near the place. But Scott's skill at finding small things like that is uh, really unparalleled, so I'm not sure I'll ever manage it. The sun, as you can see, has left some magnificent embers glowing on the tips of the Drakensberg there. And this is the first sunset we've had in about, well, probably five days or so. We've had all that cloud, and tomorrow we'll be back to the heat. It was a very, very pleasant temperature today, a lovely 30 degrees. And Scott says very kindly that he will repay me uh, with a fine drink when he get back, when he gets back for the compliment that I just paid him. Thank you, Scott. That's very nice of you. Anyway, 
I think it has been the most incredible day. And as you say, James Richard, unexpected sightings, hyenas, wild dogs, lions around the corner. That's why, of course, driving around this magnificent wonderland is always such fun. That's going to be it from us tonight. Thank you, David, for your efforts today. Well done. Uh, we're going to say thanks to Louise back on the vocals, of course, for the first time in a while. Leanne is heading back to Johannesburg tomorrow, I think, so she'll be off the keys. And in the morning, we ha of course, we did... We must greet Jandre. He's back from a prolonged sojourn. He's with Scott. Let's go back to the Lions. Thank you for your comments and questions throughout the afternoon, and I'll see you tomorrow at 05.30. Bye-bye. Well, very kind words from Mr. Hendry. I think he may be exaggerating a little bit. He's also found some wonderful specimens, even today is a good example of his skill in finding you lots of wonderful things to look at. But, of course, I thank him kindly. Things seem to have cooled off here. No more lion calls. It's just the blacksmith lapwing that you can hear. Dip, 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 dip. Calling nearby, but what a magical evening it's been. You can still see a very faint pink tinge in those clouds. And not only the animals, but the scenery, the clouds, the weather has all been absolutely fantastic on the Sunset Safari. If you have joined us for the first time, like Dorette, please let us know your thoughts and feedback and who you are and where you're watching. We love to hear from new viewers or from the viewers who are silent ninjas who never get a hold of us. You too could let us know. I know Nikki's uncle, Phil, is one of those silent ninjas. Hello, Dominique, in Paris. And you're a brand new viewer that I was hoping to chat to, so thank you for getting a hold of us. And Dominique, you would like to know a little bit more about these lions and their possible habits of the night. Will they spend a lot of time sleeping? Will they be on the prowl? And it really does depend on the individual day and also the season, Dominique. But at the moment, tonight, I'm foreseeing that they're not going to be hugely active because they already have a full belly. It's not going to be comfortable to move around, lugging around whatever it is that they managed to feed on recently. It would have been last night that they caught something or maybe sometime during the course of the day. We can't be certain. But we did see them coming past our camp at around 8.30, 9 o'clock last night, and they were definitely not full-bellied. Now, in general, though, Dominique, uh, your general rule for big cats and regular domestic cats, I think it's applicable to them as well, is that they will spend 16 to 20 hours sleeping every day. And in my history uh, with these animals, it's closer to the 20-hour mark as a general rule. Oh, there was a water thick knee calling there. Um, so, Dominique, to get them active and on the move requires a lot of luck and timing, and they do do the majority of moving at night when it's cool and there is cover of darkness. So, because we don't spend too much time out after dark, we don't get to see them moving as much as we would like to, but there are plans to start spending more time out after dark with the correct equipment so that we don't have to interfere with their ongoings. So that is in the pipeline and something to look forward to. And it's great to know that a new viewer is enjoying things all the way in Paris. The birds are going crazy. Like I said, it's the water thickness that we can mainly hear calling. Now here they go again. Those are the blacksmith lapwings. Hello, Eileen. You would like to know if it's normal for lioness to split up from their pride. The fifth member of this pride is missing at the moment. And yes, it is normal. Reasons for it, hard to be certain. It's not, you, you'd assume that one major time that a lioness may 
peel away from the pride is when she is going off to mate, looking for love. So that would be a good example of when they may separate. Another very good example is three months after mating, once they need to give birth. They will separate themselves from the pride, go give birth somewhere secluded, maybe join up with the pride to feed on a kill that they've made, but not take the cubs back as a general rule to the pride for a couple of weeks. So that would be another time that they would move off. Other times, it just simply cannot be explained. Even watching these four last nights on the quarantine clearings, three of them moved off and left one of them behind. And why that one felt that it made sense not to move initially with the pride, we simply cannot understand or be certain of. So some things in nature we will just never be able to explain. And I guess this is an example of that. They've all got their own personalities and moods, just like we as humans do. And I guess sometimes you could ask yourself, why am I acting so strangely? And even you may not know the answer to your own behavior. Well, Chandra, just to pan across quickly and show you the beautiful clouds while the lines of all got their heads down. Look at this. Absolutely fascinating scenes here, as well as sounds with all the birds calling. I hope you're all enjoying this. This is for Dominique and Direct, the new viewers. This is not your typical sunset safari. The sunset in itself has been magical and all the animals playing along with it is really made for a special evening and special memories that we're all sharing with one another on a live safari. Can you believe it? Hard to believe. Now, another question has just come through. Interesting, we're interested to know about the length of a lion from tip to toe. And I would say about eight feet from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail would be the average length of a lioness. So yeah, in and around the eight feet mark, I'm just imagining myself lying next to one of them. And I'm about six foot and I think they would have an extra couple of feet on me once they are fully extended. In terms of their shoulder heights, probably about three and a half to four feet at the shoulder. Come on, ladies, there's just a minute and some change left. Why don't you call for us, please? Hello, Virginia. You would like to know if Amber Eyes is currently with the pride or if she is the missing lioness, and she is here. I'm not sure which one she is out of the four of them in this current state, but I did definitely get a glimpse of her earlier. It's not that one. That I can tell you, that we, that the eyes we can see. So she is here. I'm not too sure which one is missing or where she is. Maybe she was the lion that was vocalizing further east of us, and who knows, maybe she has been on a adventure in search of passion with the Birmingham males. <laughs> Hello, Karen. You'd like to know if these ladies are having a little snooze to ready themselves for a big night out with the Birmingham boys. They could well be. They very could well be. And we're going to only find out about that in the morning. Thank you very, very much to everyone involved. And especially a big, big welcome back to Jandre, who did a fantastic job on camera, considering the only camera he's been working with is an iPhone for the last couple of weeks in Australia. So good to have you back and well done. Of course, Louise did a great job in the director's chair today with Leanne lending her hand, so thank you. And to all the viewers, especially the new ones, spread the word, keep joining in. We will be out tomorrow at seven, uh, sorry, at five o'clock. 5.30, sorry, Central Africa time until 8.30, so three-hour safari in the morning. Thank you all for joining, and one last quick view of the ladies. We have already snuck over time, but tonight has just been too good to 
stick to the schedule. So enjoy the last view of them and we'll see you all on the Sunrise Safari.